Yeah, hello and welcome to session four of our Tech Me Up webinar series on artificial intelligence. Um, this is our fourth session today. We have already covered various topics such as AI regulation, copyright, the very important topic of artificial intelligence and liability. So who is liable if something goes wrong? And today's session is solely about data data protection and artificial intelligence. We could speak about this topic for hours, but we'll keep it short and concise, just 45 minutes with the possibility for you to raise questions at the end, if time permits. And as always, the session will be recorded and the slides will be sent around afterwards. My name is Paul Voigt. I'm a partner in uh, Taylor Wessing's Berlin office, uh, focusing on tech and data. And Taylor Wessing is an international law firm with more than 1,000 attorneys in 17 countries, uh, with a very, very large tech law team. More than 100 of our lawyers internationally focus on tech law. And a few of them are with us here today. My dear colleague, um, Reike German from our Dusseldorf office, Chris Jeffrey from our London office, Benjamin Znati from our Paris office and Fabrizio Sanna from our uh, befriended law firm Orsinger in Italy. As mentioned, we will speak about data, data protection and AI today. And why is that important? Basically, data protection uh, plays a role in every stage of artificial intelligence during the developing of an AI solution, when testing the AI solution, and of course, also when using the AI model. Yeah, developers need training data and actually in order to be able to develop the solution. And very often this training data will include personal information. So data relating to individuals as well. They will scrape the internet uh, just to collect data. Um, and actually the scraping has been considered as a very, uh, yeah, a very heavy potential non-compliance with the data protection uh, requirements by a number of regulators just uh, a few weeks ago. Um, when they do that, when they use this data for training purposes or even for testing purposes afterwards, whenever you use personal data, you will need to ensure that it's compliance with GDPR and that you have a legal basis for doing so and that you're transparent about what you do vis-a-vis uh, -vis the data subjects whose data you're using, which can be very challenging uh, due to the huge amount of data that you're using in that regard. But also the users of AI systems, um, they will be uh, they will have to take a close look at data protection requirements. Because very often when using those systems, you will freely share information with uh, with the tool providers. Yeah, For example, if you use ChatGPT, you will, you will input prompts. And those prompts, again, will oftentimes include personal data. So you share personal data with third party and thereby lose control over what you're doing uh, with the data and a third party will gain access. And there is this one example where um, Developers of Samsung has have uploaded proprietary code to ChatGPT to see whether the code is correct. And now other uh, users, if they find the right prompt and ask the right questions, they can actually get access to this proprietary code. So um, once you input those data to the system, you may potentially lose control. We will cover all those topics today and uh, I will stop uh, talking right away and hand it over directly to Fabrizio, our first speaker, who will give an overview on legal basis. Fabrizio, the floor is yours. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for, to Taylor Bassin for organizing this seminar and inviting me. Thank you for all of those who are attending. I, my short intervention will be about legal basis and DPA uh, when data are processing, are processed through the AI under both the point of view of applicable rules and use of AI to facilitate compliance uh, with privacy rules. With regard to the uh, legal basis, I will consider how the legal basis providing the GPR can apply to justify the processing of data by the AI provider, because all processing of personal data or data related to individuals need to have a suitable legal basis to be performed. 
The first legal basis can be contract, but contract can be used only in few cases in this field because uh, will be a suitable legal basis only when the data are processed by the AI provider to perform a service for the uh, for a third party for a user and the service covered by the agreement can be performed performed only through the AI instrument as Christopher will explain us later during this seminar in most of the cases and notably when the processing is carried out in the interest of the AI provider for much machine learning purposes for instance legal basis shall be consent or legitimate interest both of them are subject to the general rules of the GDPR consent need to be informed and pre-given and informed means that the suitable information statement should be provided to user to interested party as Marika will explain in a minute why to rely on legitimate interest a suitable DPIA a document showing necessity and proportionality of the processing should be drafted and this will be dealt with by Benjamin at a later stage AI provider like to rely on legitimate interest in this field because it's a easier legal basis to rely on if this approach it sound will be determined in the future by the approach that will be finally adopted by the regulator on this field under the eu perspective we can see that there are in some way contrasting uh, messages sent by the eu if we see the copyright directive 2019 we see that a fair use exception uh, for the use of copyrighted material is machine learning so there seems to be a favor for this kind of processing why recently the AB parliament uh, sent a message opposing strongly opposing the use of certain data such as biomet biometric data through ai processing so probably or maybe the issue with the soul striking a balance which may allow the use of general data for machine learning purposes based on the digital interest while certain data will not be uh, suitable for processing based on legitimate interest basis or not to be used for ai processing at all legal the legal obligation is is not a viable legal basis in this file field now because it would imply the existence of a rules a law which require the ai system to be used to comply with a law which is not the case public interest and vital interest are relevant under the public sector point of view but less under a business perspective on the other hand we may stress that uh, a ai can be a great tool to help in compliance with legal basis requirement because can be used to map contracts when contract is the legal basis chosen for the processing can be used to collect and map user consent when consent is the legal basis and may serve as a support to elaborate a dpia when the ai provider wants to rely on legitimate interest or in general data processor in general <clears throat> coming to data processing agreements data processing agreements need to be entered between a data processor who is the one who collected and processes the personal data with the data controller who is the third party in charge of processing the data on behalf of the data processor which is relevant here is if there is a relationship of data processor data controller which triggers the requirement that a DPA is entered into. This is the case when the AI is an instrument used by a third party controller of the data 
In this case, the provider of the AI service needs to, ar need to arrange a DPA and ask the data controller to enter into the DPA. Conversely, when the AI provider processes the data in, in interest as a controller, no DPA is required. The position can overlap in that, in most cases, the uh, AI provider both provide the service to the party and use the same data for machine learning purposes. In this case, the first processing needs to be um, covered by the DPA, while the processing on the interest of the data processor, the AI provider, needs to be covered by a suitable legal basis and supported by a privacy policy, as Marika will say in a minute. Uh, on the other hand, the AI can be very beneficial also in this field because can be very useful in mapping the processing in order to uh, prepare the attachment to the EPA, supporting the creation of the EPA itself, and implementing, checking the compliance of the IT system with the DPA. Obviously, this is, uh, all this is evolving both under a regulatory point of view and in connection with the use that the, the AI is practically, uh, on how this AIU, uh, AI is used in this field. And I leave the stage to Marika. Yeah, thank you very much, Fabrizio, for very interesting insights and your thoughts um, on the lawfulness of data processing. So, and um, well, that are not the only challenges with respect to GDPR when you're using um, AI systems. So let's talk about um, transparency and data subject rights. And well, as a special note, um, well, we have taken article 22 out of the scope of that part, but my UK colleague Chris will talk about it in more detail because um, here we uh, need a special view on that requirement. So don't be surprised about that. So, well, when we think of um, transparency and uh, data subject rights, it quickly becomes clear that the requirements represent a particular challenge um, when you want to use AI, which will process personal data. Uh, well, why? If you want to fulfill that obligations, you need a very deep um, insight into the data processing and you have to implement measures and processes which allowed you to take influence on the data processing. So you must be in, uh, you must be able from a technical part of you and also from your processors to delete data or to release data, to stop the data processing, for instance, if um, the data subject uh, wants to object the data processing. And you need um, a very detailed view of the data uh, processing because otherwise you can be not such transparent and you cannot inform in that way you uh, and um, on to that level which is needed and which is required to fulfill the requirements of a GDPR. So due to that fact, the question arises whether this is even possible for a controller and it's independently if you are an AI developer or an AI deployer, so a user of the AI system, um, you can be compliant. And well, to be honest, this is um, only possible to a certain extent, and that's something you have to be aware of. And what makes it so complicated when you use AI? Um, well, the AI system is learning with information, with data, and um, processes data, it takes decisions, and the basis of that decisions are data, so information on a um, non-personal and on a personal basis. So, um, and not very often it is clear how the decision is uh, taken and what was the basis of the decision. And that makes it very complicated. 
Further, it's a challenge to delete data because um, uh, if, if the AI system learns with that data, you can only reset the AI system. That's also not a possible solution for all of us. So these are the challenges um, when we think about it. And um, so due to the fact or due to all that facts, at first you have to identify what, what data processing role you have here. So are you a controller? Because only then you have to fulfill these requirements by the GDPR. So are you a controller? Are you maybe a joint controller? So what does it mean? Do you determine the purposes and the means of the data processing alone or with maybe um, the AI developer or another third party? Or are you just only a processor? So that's something you have to be imagine. And so um, what do the EU data protection authorities say and what are the points of criticism? And I think it's easier to discuss it or the main points of criticism with regard to one example. And here we have ChatGPT, as you all know. And well, these criticisms um, were directed to OpenAI, but you can also uh, think about it when you are just only a user of, the, of an AI system. Also, then you have to think about all that issues. So what were the main critical points? It was criticized that people with data were collected by OpenAI are not adequately informed about it. And um, well, there were no information about the data sources in the privacy policy. Further, there were no information about the algorithm behind that automated um, data processing. Um, further, there were also no mechanism that allows the data subject to um, delete data, to object the data processing and so on. Um, also, there were no information and no clar clarity about that point on whether data will be shared with third parties, maybe with uh, commercial interests. And um, also it was discussed that in that case, non-users of ChatGPT yeah, um, um, were not enabled to, to um, make claims um, or to, to, to use their data subject rights and to be informed in that they, that they can um, be aware of that rights. Um, because, well, the AI system learns with all data and all information it gets. So, at a whole or in a summary, the level of detail of information is a key challenge. And also the missing mechanism very often. So, especially when we think of data deletion, because um, then you can only reset AI systems if the AI system learns with that data. So how to deal with all the challenges? Um, I think first of all, and I think it's um, it's uh, also with respect to all the points we, all my cousins, uh, colleagues um, discussed it, um, you have to make a fundamental and informed decision when you want to use AI, how do you want to use it? Um, should the user, so your employees or your customers be um, entitled to enter personal data into the AI system or not? Because if they should be allowed to do it, then the risk increases. Further, you have to decide on it um, um, if you want to enable the AI developer that it uses the data for training purposes. Also, then the risk increases. And if you do not want to um, enable him, um, then you should be aware of, is there an option to switch that function off or not, so that you can stop that data processing activity. And then you have to identify your own role because only then you know um, which um, data processing will for which purposes personal data are processed. 
um, which role do you have and which duties do you have? So, and when you think of transparency, um, then you can realize, okay, why do you have to identify that? So you have to form as a controller about your own data processing. So maybe if you are the AI developer, you have to inform the world for original learning of the AI system. If you're just only the user, yeah, just put maybe the link into the privacy policy and um, inform your data subject by that. Well, then inform about the user input, so the data which are entered into the AI system, and maybe if you enabled the AI developer um, to use it for further learning of the AI system, then also inform about that. And um, also with respect to the chance we have with transparency, be aware of your risks. So, um, if you want to, to enable or if you want to use personal data for training purposes, be aware of that there is a kind of black box. You cannot inform about it, how the AI system is learning with personal data, non-personal data. Also be aware of, and, and Chris will um, tell you more about it, um, how you have to inform about the logic involved in the AI system. So if you are just only the user, we um, ask the a, um, AI developer about that information, about that documentation, so that you can put it into your privacy policy. And further, we have some statements about uh, from um, privacy authorities about using AI systems. And sometimes they mention facilitations such as the CNIL has. So if you said, okay, I want to use that kind of facilitations, then document that. And uh, so that statement embedded was the basis of your decision, how you want to um, use AI systems. And also with respect to the other requirements, so the data su um, subject rights also, you have to, to um, um, handle like that. So you know that data cannot be deleted or very hardly deleted. So it's, um, it's a kind of um, mechanism to reduce the risk that you said, okay, I use just only the data I really need. So um, use the principle of data minimization as a kind of reducing the risk. And further, also use facilitations made by law because also the law said you do not have to inform about trade secrets. So just keep in mind, if you have to be transparent according to 13 or 14 of a GPR, or if you have to answer um, a request by right to access, that you that you are be aware of facilitations you had made by statements of privacy authorities and made by law. And as you ultimately realize, it's all about risk reduction measures. And now I would like to turn over to my colleague, Benjamin, which has some more information. Thank you, Mary Key, and uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I will now discuss uh, two uh, very important uh, principles of GDPR, which are uh, security and privacy by design and default. And I will try to illustrate some of the main concern and solution uh, when applying this principle to AI. In essence, these two principles require companies to implement robust technical and organizational measures that will both address security and privacy risk when developing or using a AI uh, system. Um, one of the first issue we have is to uh, respect the privacy by default principle, which is uh, the very core principle of GDPR under which the controller shall only process the per personal data that are strictly necessary for the purpose of processing. There is, however, here a difficulty to find a compromise between this principle and what we call statistical accuracy, that is uh, that can be explained as the need for AI system to learn from 
from large amounts of data to enhance uh, their accuracy. Another important issue uh, we see is that uh, AI is currently very reliable on APIs and third party models. This is also a reason why AI is um, growing very fastly uh, in the market, but it also impl implies to, uh, to implement very solid measures uh, to identify and mitigate risks that can potentially come from various uh, sources. Another thing that you need to have in mind is that AI systems face both generic but unique threats that are specific to them. I will give some uh, very quick examples. You have the idea of poisoning, which is an attack that consists of injecting data within a model, and it will disturb the, the model to create inaccurate results. Uh, models that are continuously learning are very exposed to these threats. Um, we have another threat that is called inference, and that is creating a direct privacy risk here because it's the idea of entering manipulative inputs in the AA system that will trick the system and will lead the system to reveal confidential outputs. It's a little bit what Paul mentioned earlier with the Samsung link where there was a risk that the confidential information that was fed into the system could be revealed by manipulative uh, input. There is also what we call evasion, which is uh, the, uh, an attack that aims at targeting the performance of the system and that creates a significant safety risk, especially for uh, an autonomous system. Uh, for example, uh, one attack that is given is to trick uh, an AA system within a self-driving car, and the car will think that the green signal is red or the opposite, which can create a very obvious risk. Um, and we have also, for example, extraction, which is an attack that is aimed at replicating or accessing an, an AI core model, um, and often by exploiting vulnerabilities in APIs. So all the risks I just mentioned are um, more related, I would say, to the building of the AI system. But we all know that the mere use of the AI is also a risk. Uh, I will again mention the Samsung link, the leak uh, case that Paul mentioned earlier. But here it was on proprietary information. But we could, uh, we could for example, uh, um, illustrate a situation where an employee will feed into an AI a database with personal data. And by doing so, the employee will not potentially realize that he's performing a personal data breach within the meaning of GDPR. And finally, another big threat that is likely to increase also in the future is the use of AI as a weapon. We have a lot of experts that are, are, are expecting generative EA to be used in the future to perform cyber attack. So these are the uh, glance of the, the current risk that are, uh, that are faced by AA, but hopefully we have some solutions that, uh, that, 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 that exist. Uh, some are old, some are new. Uh, one of the first uh, recommendation we can give is to distinguish uh, the, the AE training from the production when you implement security and privacy measures. Um, for various reasons, uh, distinguishing these two phases is helpful. Uh, for example, uh, one of the first reasons is that threats are specific to each, to each phase. Uh, threats at the learning phase are not the same that at the production phase. And it's also the same for data. The data that are used and that are necessary at the training phase are also not the same at the production phase. So just making sure that your process are different in these two phases is a way of mitigating risk. One straightforward recommendation, but that is not new, but it is very relevant for AI system, is to implement privacy and security from day one. Th th this is actually what by design is all about. It's always more difficult uh, to handle privacy and security at the end of your building process, uh, rather than when you implement privacy and security from day one of your building. 
we, we mentioned earlier the risk uh, of third party, so it's also very important to establish approved uh, services and source, uh, not only for uh, data, but also for the third party potential model that you will use and also the code. It's very important that people that are involved in building your, your AI system have useful guidance to know uh, what trusted source they can rely to to build this model. I also mentioned here new threats, uh, new threats for AI, but hopefully there are also new solutions. I will not go into detail because they are uh, it's quite complicated, but and and there's a lot of very useful guidance from data protection authorities, notably the CNIL and the ACO, but there are new security uh, measures that exist for AI, both at the training phase with uh, federated learning, for example, synthetic data, adding noise, which is basically the idea of feeding into the model data that are not relevant in order to trick attackers and protect the data you want to protect. Um, and there is also a, a new measure at the production phase. So it's very important uh, to update and improve your existing security policies to implement these new security measures that are very uh, related to addressing specific AI risk. Um, AI implementation and introduction also demands to revisit your existing policies. Uh, the Samsung Link leak case illustrates uh, the need to educate employees on the risk uh, of feeding sensitive data into AI model available online. So uh, it is very important that your personnel know, uh, know the risk of using AI. And it's also very true when you implement an AI tool within your organization. Fabrizio mentioned earlier the, 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 the rules related to DPAs. So it's very important just even before you implement the, the DPA, that your risk assessment for processors and third party providing you AI are also updated so you can appropriately assess the risk uh, that are related to AI when you implement these tools from uh, these providers in, 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 within your organization. And finally, uh, talking just uh, be, uh, about risk assessment, uh, establishing a data privacy impact assessment when building or implementing AI is probably one of the better solutions uh, that you want to, to address to mitigate your risk. Uh, DPAAs are not only mandatory according to GDPR, but they can in specific case, uh, notably when the AI is doing profiling or automated decision, which Chris will explain uh, just after me. But even when a DPIA is not mandatory, you, you should consider implementing a DPIA on a voluntary basis. Uh, as we all know, security is not only an issue for personal data, it's, a, it's an issue for all data. And we have regulation coming, notably the AI European Act that also uh, implies to perform risk assessment depending on uh, the level of risk of the AI system. So probably companies should not consider implementing risk assessment as a standard process for AI because again, AI is a fantastic uh, new technology, but there are very important risks uh, in terms of security and privacy. And the better way to and that this risk is probably to be prepared uh, to them. And I will now let the stage to, to Chris. Thanks, Benjamin. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that. I think AI is probably one of the few examples where you would probably say you always need to have a DPIA. And, and one element that is not unique to AI, but is particularly prevalent in AI that needs to be part of your DPIA is this issue of automated decision making. Um, and if if there's one, I know I've got the graveyard shift just before the end, but if there's one takeaway from my bit, it would be to think about this issue of ADM, as we call it, early in your assessment of your AI system. And the reason for that is, one, AI really lends itself to this. If you look at some AI systems, you might think, 
Well, automated decision making is the whole point. That's why I'm using this thing. The output is a decision or at least a recommendation which may feed into a decision. So this article 22 suddenly becomes really relevant in the context of, of, of AI. And then I just wanted to mention the discrimination risk uh, really quickly. Many years ago, when US corporates started using AI for recruitment decisions, they did it on training data that was based on the existing workforce and found, of course, that the decisions coming out reflected any bias in terms of gender or ethnicity or anything else. So another aspect of ADM is thinking about those non-privacy elements of, uh, of, fairness, of fairness as well. So why does it matter so much? Why do I why am I so adamant that you must think about this stuff? I think the reason is automated decision making has a more restrictive group of lawful bases than GDPR generally. So Fabrizio is absolutely right. We're always tempted to run to legitimate interests because it means we don't need to have a consent. We don't need to worry about withdrawing consent. Sure, we do our LIAs and our DPIAs, but it's a more flexible lawful basis. If you are doing automated decision making, it's not available for this aspect of the AI, and it could be a central one. As you'll see on the right there, the, the only lawful bases available are that it's necessary for a contract with the individual authorized by EU law, or you have the explicit consent of the user. Now, we know from guidance that um, necessary for a contract could be satisfied where you get tens of thousands of applications for a role and you simply haven't got the people to go through all of those and do initial checks. So you, you use AI to filter them. Authorized by EU law may be available for cybersecurity, coming back to Benjamin's presentation. So th there may be some useful ways of avoiding explicit consent, but for some AI, you are going to be in the realms of explicit consent. And so you don't want to waste time on legitimate interest assessment if it's not going to be available. The, 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 other, the, the other key thing to remember here is if it is automated decision making, the user on the end of that decision must have the right to object and to demand meaningful human intervention. So that's got to be built into your processes. So where do we draw the line between automating processes and, and normal processing for the purposes of AI, if I can put it that way? The key two key things are it must be automated processing. At, there must be the sole basis for the decision and it must produce legal or similarly significant effects. Now, these are not as simple as you, uh, as you may think. To take some examples, we, we know for sure if, if uh, a credit scoring application automatically disqualifies someone based on an AI analysis of their data, that that is going to be automated decision-making and these restrictive provisions kick in. But there's a recent interesting case before the European co courts called Schufa, where a German entity which does credit scoring may be about to be held to be doing automated decision making itself, even though all it produces is the credit score, which it then passes to the bank, its customer, and the bank then makes the decision. The attorney general, and as European lawyers will know, the court usually, but not always, follows the opinion of the attorney general, has decided that actually the credit score itself is automated decision making, even though that's not a denial of the loan, because the bank draws strongly on that credit score in making the decision. So the lines around automated decision making are actually much more blurred than you may than you may think uh, uh, at first. So have it right there at the top of your list when you're when you're looking at your AI system compliance. And I'm going to touch on this very quickly. From a UK approach and post Brexit, we're not at the center. We talking as a Brit and not at the center of these debates anymore. But particularly, I think, for lawyers who are not perhaps really into the weeds on AI and privacy, the ICO guidance, I would give a quick shout out for. I think it's very detailed, but it's also really helpful as a starting point in working out how you deal with these issues. And I can see Paul, which is my cue to be quiet. So thank you, everyone. Thanks uh, very much, Chris. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, and I think uh, we have like a uh, few more minutes for uh, for questions. 
and um, uh, maybe everyone can join the stage again. Thanks very much. And Chris, I have a, um, a, like one question directly uh, relating to your presentation. So uh, Article 22 and automated decision making. I mean, once you're in, it's uh, super difficult to navigate. Um, uh, very, yeah, um, very annoying. So um, how, how, uh, how do you stay out of it? Um, maybe, I, I don't know, um, one thing is uh, it, it only applies if you have um, a legal like, like like a relevant impact to to the individual is that maybe uh, something where that can be a way out uh, in in a number of cases yep yeah it, it 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 could it could be so the the examples we have are credit scoring hiring decisions in the edpb guidance or the article 29 guidance in 2017 it even says that online dynamic pricing if it has the effect of excluding a group of individuals or a user from access to a product, maybe that significant legal effect. But you're right, there will be many other examples perhaps where it just it just doesn't have that. It doesn't have that that implication. So if it's used for cybersecurity purposes, for instance, to work out um, you know, if traffic is fraudulent or, or poses a risk to the system, that kind of thing. Chatbots typically, you know, volunteering automated responses to user queries online, that kind of thing is, I think, very unlikely to be automated decision making. It really is something about denying a user access to a job or a loan or or some kind of opportunity welfare public services etc which are which are the really key examples i think to look at and uh one one more question with respect to article 22 because i think it's probably the the more like the major uh, stipulation in the gdpr when it comes to ai um what about human oversight i mean human oversight under the new AI, upcoming ai act is also like a major instrument in order to yeah to cope with the dangers of ai and that's also an instrument that is uh, foreseen in article 22 what does it mean and uh, yeah, uh, how much human oversight? I uh, know I put you on the spot there with a quite difficult question. Uh, how much uh, human oversight do we need to get? <laughs> <laughs> no, you, Ed, it's, a really, it's a really key point. And I think there is a bit of a knee-jerk response under some privacy lawyers that as long as it gets across the desk of a real human and they think about it for a couple of seconds, that's human intervention. And I don't think that's enough. In fact, we know from the guidance that it's not going to be enough. Even the ICO, relatively light touch, talks about meaningful human intervention. And so if, for instance, yeah, sure, a human looks at it, but actually in practice, the AI decision is rubber stamped pretty much all the time. That's not going to be enough human intervention. I think you've got to show that the person has the authority to question the logic by which that result has been uh, has been reached and has the internal authority actually to override it. Um, uh, you know, if you have spot checks, for instance, say you have an initial filtering of job applications and you a human looks meaningfully at one in 10, that's not going to be enough. That would still be automated decision making for the rest. And so you'd be in you very much within the rules uh, for those. So I think, yeah, you've got to you've got to show I think it's good. A good record keeping point is to actually show how that human intervention works in practice and how many decisions are both reviewed and overridden by human intervention. Yeah. That's the kind of thing that would help you defend a challenge if you decided it's not ADM and a regulator looking in later decided that it probably was. And and of course, and, and this is also like a question that has uh, just come up now, it may be actually difficult to, to actually have a decent human intervention if, if you rely on a third party tool that is a black box to you and you don't know how the tool has come to a certain solution, how can you actually double check it, how can you have human intervention, you can say well it feels yeah. right. But is it right? Like you probably there's so much going on that uh, that remains hidden to you. Uh, quite difficult and maybe something that the AI Act, uh, when it's going to be passed, likely in uh, Q1 next year, I heard, uh, maybe that is something that's going to tackle uh, this issue. We are at the end of our session. Um, sorry that we have not been able to answer all the questions, but we'll try to follow up uh, via email. Thank you uh, to the speakers. Uh, it was very interesting. Thanks, everyone, um, for joining. And have a great evening or rest of the day uh, if you're in the US. Take care. Bye-bye.